Listener Production. Hi, Sasha Barbie Gat with you. Welcome to The Briefing. PFAS, or forever chemicals, seem to be turning up in just about everything. They've been found in Sydney's water supply, in platypuses and in human testicles. But the science of what these chemicals actually do to the human body is yet to be settled. What should they do? Tell us what you know, health authorities. Tell us what you know. The World Health Organisation regards some of these as carcinogens. Make that very clear. And make sure there's clear, open public policy and explanation about what is banned. What might you have in your shed? Tell us what you know. Monitor it. So with all this conflicting science, how should regular people be thinking about these chemicals? And what should we do about them? That's coming up in the second half of this episode. First, though, it's time for the headlines with Helen Smith. Today's Monday, the 26th of August. Morning, Sasha. Israel and Hezbollah have exchanged rocket fire in a major escalation of long-simmering conflict between the pair. The IDF launched what it's called preemptive strikes at southern Lebanon yesterday, saying it had intelligence Hezbollah was planning to fire at Israel. The Iranian-backed militants then launched drones and more than 320 rockets against 11 Israeli military sites, saying it was the first phase of its response to the death of one of its top commanders in an Israeli airstrike last month. It's not clear if or when a second phase may come. Yeah, Israel has now declared a 48-hour state of emergency, which gives the IDF powers to issue restrictions on civilian movement, while a number of airlines have also suspended flights to Tel Aviv for the next 48 hours. Both sides reportedly exchanged messages after the violence, indicating neither wanted a further escalation. Now, that's according to Reuters. Look, despite that, UN agencies have all described the latest developments as worrying and they are calling for a de-escalation. And this has been one of the biggest exchanges we've seen between the two sides. Now, they have been firing back and forth at each other since October 7. Hezbollah has said its attacks on Israel are in solidarity with Hamas and Palestinians in Gaza. And the other concern with Hezbollah is that they have this huge arsenal of weapons. So Israel is definitely taking that threat seriously. Uh, It's worth noting as well, Helen, ceasefire talks are continuing continuing in Cairo at the moment. Both Hamas and Israel have sent delegations. The US is optimistic about this phase of the talks, but we've heard from both Hamas and Israeli delegates who have said, mm, I wouldn't be quite so optimistic. Heading to the Northern Territory now, where Labor is licking its wounds following a major defeat to the country Liberal Party in the Territory's elections. After eight years in power, Labor lost in a landslide, with the CLP picking up 13 seats. The party's leader, former lawyer and the youngest person elected to NT Parliament, Leah Finocchiaro, will become the NT's 14th Chief Minister. Territorians have stood up against nearly two decades of escalating crime, an economy going backwards and the erosion of our once iconic lifestyle. But tomorrow is the start of a new day and a new The Territory's outgoing Chief Minister, Eva Lawler, lost her seat and admitted the defeat that it was a sad night for Labor. I know Territorians want to change. We've heard that loudly and clearly. It's a result that will be concerning for federal Labor with Australia heading to the polls in the next 12 months. Passenger rights will be in the spotlight today when the Albanese government announces a long-awaited aviation ombudsman. The landmark reforms will boost protections for passengers with disabilities, increase access to refunds and even offer possible cash compensation for delayed and cancelled flights. Now, this will replace the existing body, which is funded and run by the airlines. The scheme will also include an external dispute resolution service for customers to lodge complaints about airline and airport misconduct, which the hope of that is that it'll make refunds and compensation easier. Yeah, Sasha. Look, this scheme will see the end of carriers offering flight credits and vouchers, Mm. which is probably a big relief to a lot of flyers. Airlines will have to refund passengers full stop. So the scheme will also publish reports on airline and airport misconduct and will be able to make recommendations straight to the government. It will also be able to refer misconduct to the aid 
ACCC, which will hopefully make it easier for investigations and legal action on behalf of passengers. But it is unclear if the government will address concerns about competition in the airline industry. Mm. Since the collapse of Bonza and Rex, which impacted regional routes especially, industry experts have warned that the duopoly held by the Qantas Group and Virgin could now increase airfares, with Qantas and Virgin now controlling more than 90% of the Australian market. And from today, the right to disconnect kicks in, which will give most Aussie employees the right to refuse to monitor, read or respond to work-related contact from employers outside of their working hours. The protections don't extend to reasonable communications, though, so that's things like a work-related emergency. And it also won't be covering small business employees until this time next year. So I guess the question is, how will this be enforced? Well, workers are meant to be the first line of defence. We should talk to our bosses if we feel like they're leaning on us too much outside of our working hours. If that doesn't work, that's when you can go to the Fair Work Commission for a stop order. And it's only after mediation fails that employers can then be fined up to $18,000. So a lot of this relies on our bosses, Helen, to be, Mm. you know, good people and say, you know what? Yes, we're going to, we're going to enforce this right as well. We think our employees deserve to not have to monitor, you know, their, their, emails or answer a text outside of hours. The right is mainly about making sure that employees can't get into trouble. So your boss might still send you a message outside of work hours. They can't then get mad at you the next day and say, well, I'm docking your pay or I'm doing X, Y or Z because you failed to respond to me. So, I mean, it's 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 great, but, you know, comes with a lot of caveats. Yeah, it definitely does. And it also, look, if you've got a good boss, great. And the communication's clear, amazing. Yeah. But I also think it puts a lot of the pressure on the workers mm. and it kind of does put tension between that boss in employee relationship. So yeah, I will be interested to see how this works. The other thing that I noted is kind of our working from home situation. It blurred the lines during COVID of when you're switching off, when Mm. you're at home, because it really meshed those two home environment and work environment together. So that's another very interesting aspect of when will you switch off and when does the home and work environment end. Yeah, such a good point. Helen, thanks so much for being here for the headlines. Next up, it's our deep dive into PFAS. How concerned should we be about it and what can we do about it? Hey, Bencion here. Every few days, it seems we hear another worrying story about PFAS, this group of chemicals that just don't break down, turning up somewhere they shouldn't. Last week, Sydney Water confirmed they'd been found in drinking water, though at levels below Australian drinking water guidelines, and a group of scientists also revealed PFAS had been found in platypus. Also last week, Independent Senator Lydia Thorpe won support to hold a Senate inquiry into the health and environmental impacts of PFAS. But for those of us without an expert knowledge of this subject, it's equal parts concerning and confusing. There's consensus that these chemicals accumulate in the environment, in animals and in us. That's why they're called forever chemicals. They don't break down. But whether they're a serious health risk to humans depends on which government or scientific agency is speaking about it at the time. Today, water researcher and associate professor at Western Sydney University's School of Science, Ian Wright, is here to help us. Ian, thanks so much for joining us. To start with, can you just give us the 30 second, what is PFAS? PFAS is an acronym we hear a lot in the news at the moment. It's a man-made molecule or a series of them, and it's basically a chain of carbon atoms bonded with fluorine atoms and a couple of others, and they're brilliant. They do a wonderful job. They're moisture-resistant, heat-resistant, oil-resistant, and they never break down. And this is the problem. Even at really low concentrations, they don't break down, they can accumulate, and they're causing a whole world of problems. What do we do with these chemicals? What products are they in? Oh, it's enormous. I don't know that I've ever seen it fully listed because there's so many of them, but they're very infamous 
now as a firefighting foam. So there were a surfactant that would make like a beautiful, stable bubble bath and really good for particularly for fires with fuel. So they were used at airports, used by the military, used for firefighting training purposes. So big foam that could swallow up fire. They're also used in non-stick cookware and stain-resistant or moisture-resistant coatings, very popular for bushwalking, for example. There's so many cosmetics, herbicides, cleaning products, they're everywhere, but a few of them are now taken out of production and some classes of them have even been classed as carcinogens or probable carcinogens. So now we're trying to reel in this, it's almost like an escaped ghost. (laughs) An escaped ghost, that's good. Other than them being in everything that we put out or many things that we put out, they seem to be turning up in places they shouldn't be, in platypus, in testicles, in Sydney's water supply. What is a reasonable way for people who don't have any expertise on this subject to digest those news stories? Look, it's such a good point and honestly I was one of those people that we hear all these chemical names, they sound scary and they're turning up in all kinds of places. This is the modern world and this is what we're dealing with in our air, in water, in food, in our clothes, in our workplace. If you got the pure substance, put an eye drop in an Olympic swimming pool, that's probably just made that dangerous if that was drinking water. The concentrations are so, so low, but the trouble is this can build up. It's a bit like an infamous chemical like mercury. Mercury builds up as waste, it's quite common, goes into water and then it's taken up by zooplankton, then fish, then bigger predatory fish, then we eat them. At each level, it becomes a higher and higher concentration. And that's what these PFAS chemicals are also like. Yet as it builds up, builds up in us, builds up in wildlife, and the more, particularly in lab species, the more PFAS in them, the more problems we get, you know, right up to death. There's been a lot of reporting on PFAS and it's really difficult to discern as someone who doesn't have any strong understanding about the science here, what is real because PFAS has reportedly been linked to all kinds of serious health impacts, cancer, kidney disease, birth defects. But Australian authorities seem really quite relaxed about this. For example, South Australia's Environmental Protection Authority says whether PFAS causes health issues in humans is currently unclear, although adverse effects in animals suggest it might be harmful to human health. What are we supposed to make of all this? It's such a good point, and you've put that really well. They do seem relaxed. I think that's the outward-facing of government agencies and regulators, I think behind those closed doors, they are freaking right out. And this is particularly because the guidelines and what we consider to be safe in Australia is not the same as what they consider safe overseas. And the leaders are America because, not surprisingly, America is where this technology is largely centred and the 3M company is based in Minnesota. They first created some of these products. So America is dealing with this on a really big scale. It's entered their water supply. It's causing all kinds of problems. They have a growing body of knowledge that it does cause human disease and illness. But the standards they've now applied are so tough that the rest of the world is basically chewing their fingernails and going, oh, my God, I don't know that we can do that. Should we measure it? Perhaps we shouldn't. Even talking about it, are we freaking people out? So I think behind closed doors, both the health industry and the water industry don't really know what to do at the moment. What should be the principle for those kinds of agencies and for the government? Should it be the precautionary principle that we need to ban this stuff as soon as we can? Or should it be that this is in waterproof apparel, it's in frying pans, it's in all kinds of things that we use every day and that we make every day? 
Should we just blanket ban it or is there some kind of other principle we should think about here? What should they do? Tell us what you know, health authorities. Tell us what you know. The World Health Organization regards some of these as carcinogens. Make that very clear and make sure there's clear, open public policy and explanation about what is banned. What might you have in your shed? Many people have banned products like banned chemicals, herbicides that are now unregistered because they're dangerous. So tell us what you know, monitor it. And this is the thing that the US EPA is doing that I advocate and many people have missed. And they are now getting water authorities right around the states to measure everything in their water system. Basically, that's what we need to do. We need to measure everything and then make it public. And if you don't, because we have a lot of people freaking out about it, people are very worried, very anxious, and particularly people that might have a number of other contributing health issues that are upsetting them. They might have kidney disease, liver disease, and this might be the thing that pushes their health over the edge. So tell us what's there, monitor it, particularly in the water supply. That's a huge act of faith. When you go to the tap and pour a glass of water and drink it, that's an act of faith. And we know if we travel, often you can't do that. So give us clear advice, tell us what you know, monitor it and help it inform our choices, our personal choices. That might be also don't use that nonstick cookware. That might also be be very careful using, for example, some grease poof paper has PFAS chemicals in it. Provide us that advice. And as a clue, go look at the US EPA because they provide the clearest, most plain English advice I have ever seen on a very confusing topic. So it sounds like you're not advocating for an outright ban, but you just want to see more information from the Australian government and other authorities. Is that right? Absolutely. I advocate an outright ban when products are, are a known carcinogen. But again, follow the leaders of the world. And our policymakers are. They're following very closely because this is a moving thing. The longer we have this chemical, the more evidence we're getting, particularly from the medical system. Sometimes that's called epidemiology. So we're noting as the levels build up in people, there are these side effects and often it's triggering uh, medical issues. And I'll just give you one bit of advice. And I only know this because I get samples tested. And I was talking to the lab manager. That lab also tests blood from people. And he said, people who eat lots of seafood often have higher PFAS in their blood. Like, who would have known that? Shouldn't there be health warnings? Shouldn't we be telling GPs and dietitians? It might not be sponsored by the seafood industry, but let's just be open and honest. Let's measure it in fish. Sensible, helpful things to help us manage what is, we don't know what's emerging, but it could be a major crisis ahead. Given that fact, is there a danger, though, of a kind of, like, doom paranoia that this could be the worst thing that's ever happened to humans and if I've got any kind of medical uh, situation that this might be making things worse, we don't actually know enough, do we? No, and it's a really good point you make. And I sometimes worry, am I contributing to this? Is it helpful? I've talked with people in the community And I've heard those voices on the other end and I've heard that anxiety and I've thought about exactly that. Ian, you're part of the problem here. Stop talking about it. But I think that's what our government is often doing, our leaders, our industry. And I'm seeing a vacuum of information. People are concerned and then often silence from the people that could, you know, go back to COVID. We had those daily briefings from the medical advisors, from the scientific advisors. I think that was actually pretty reassuring. At the moment, I think that isn't happening enough. And I think people need to know, and if not, the anxiety will grow. That's my feeling. But I could be absolutely wrong here. Ian Wright, thanks so much for joining us on The Briefing. It's an absolute pleasure. Anytime. Ian Wright there. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of The Briefing. That's it for now. Before you go, though, we'd love it if you could share this app with someone you think might enjoy it. And if you want to keep up with our other content, you can check us out on Instagram at The Briefing Podcast and on TikTok and YouTube. Just search Listener Newsroom. And we'll be back in your feed with another episode this afternoon from 3. I'm Ben Sion Siebert. Catch you next time. Listener.